Okay, so there's really two parts to this class then tonight, if this opens and works. The first part is um, how, thing, how taste gets transferred, just to understand the background information of how does taste move from a food to something else, and then the application of that to a, an oven, a stove, a toaster, a microwave, whatever else we're going to discuss tonight. So there's really two halves to the class. There is the, the how it moves, and then the, the practical part of it. Um, just to review one basic concept before we start, um, we have a concept called Tom Kicker, which is something that's very fundamental to the kosher kitchen. Right? Tom Kicker means that when the Torah prohibited um, pork, it didn't just prohibit pork itself. It's not limited to the fibers and the flesh of the animal. It extends to that flavor that that gives off. And therefore, that's the problem. Right? When you cook a uh, piece of pork in a pot, so even if you clean the pot out, that pot will have the remaining taste of non-kosher inside of it, and that's what will be a problem. When we get to our kosher kitchen, that's really our question. Often it's not going to be a mixture of, you know, you just directly cook the milk and meat together, but often, you know, your milk will splatter on the side of your meat pot or you take the wrong spoon. And it's always, it's generally going to be talking about um, flavor or taste is normally going to be the problem of, of issue here. So let's get started. The most basic rule of thumb, I remember when I first got married, my rabbi told me his name was my burger. He said, um, the rule of thumb, if you want to know the best way, number one rule for a kosher kitchen, that is to try your best to keep your kitchen clean. So when your kitchen is clean, then you just have less problems. Most problems tend to arise because you left your milk pot out on top of your stove, and then you started cooking your meat, and your milk pot was still there, and then it's, it splattered. But if you would have cleaned it and put it away, it wouldn't have splattered. Or it just, things tend to get, when, there's, when these are dirtier, then it tends to just cause more problems. When it's clean, you just take out what you're using, put it away when you're done. This is you know, more, somewhat of a personality thing, and it depends, you know, each person has to know themselves. It's gonna be a, it should not be a source of stress for you. But just as a, a sagely advice that I got from my rabbi passing it forward, I can't say me and my wife always employed it ourselves, but just as a good advice to the cleaner your kitchen is, definitely the less questions, the less things spill on the wrong thing. And uh, <laughs> it seems like there's interesting things going on over there. <laughs> you agree. Okay, we got you guys' agreement. That's good. But, um... Yeah. Um, so, in your specific example, what if you have, if you have only one fridge, how do you separate it? I mean, do you just kind of do the best you can? Right, so one fridge is a, is a great question. I actually forgot to include refrigerators on it. I think we go through every single, every single other item in the kitchen bar refrigerators, but um, we'll get to it. Let's first, right now, discuss, if I don't get to it, remind me that I forgot to put it on here. Sure. But let's first just discuss um, the background information of that question, which is, how would taste get transferred that we now have to see, well, how would that apply to a refrigerator, how would that apply to an oven, where's the potential risk here, and then how do we safeguard ourselves from it. So, a basic question to, to start off really is taste transfers. And the question with that is, how exactly does taste get transferred? So if these are the guys cooking in your kitchen, be careful that uh, it might not end up good. But there's really there's two parts to transferring taste. And that is, there's something called, um, I guess you can call it like an inducer, this would be something like heat or salt. We'll discuss in a second the examples of it. Things that cause taste to be transferred from point A to point B. And then there's a medium that the taste gets transferred through. So we're going to go now through the five inducers, five processes that can be going on that will cause taste to transfer. At the same time, there's uh, carriers or mediums um, that, caught, that are kind of the carriers of the, of the taste from point A to point B. Now, there's only two things that can really carry taste. That is either liquid or fat, meaning like a fatty piece of meat can transfer taste even though it's not liquid. So if you have something that is absolutely, totally dry on all sides, so let's say you have an absolutely dry, super hot meat pot and a super hot milk pot, but they're both totally dry to the touch, and the exteriors of them touch in a totally dry interaction, that's not a problem. We, the rabbi said you shouldn't do these things because it's going to spill and things are going to happen, but there's no transfer of taste if everything is totally dry. So you need to always have either a liquid medium or a fatty medium for taste to practically get transferred. Now, in what situation are they going to get transferred? We mentioned um, in the past, let's say you accidentally took a meat spoon and you ate your cereal with it. You have milk, which is milky, and uh, you have your Cheerios, let's say, your Wheaties, and you uh, eat it with a flashic meat spoon by accident. So we've mentioned in the past, since everything is cold here, right? even though you have liquid, you have the medium to get chase transferred. You also need to have what I'll refer to as the inducer, which is a 
think I borrowed that term from Rabbi Forrest's book I showed you last week. But it's the process that kind of pushes the taste from point A to point B. Since everything is cold here in a bowl of milk, so again, you shouldn't try to avoid it because whenever you start mixing milk and meat, things just happen. But uh, for sure, ex post facto, nothing happens to your spoon. Your spoon is totally fine. Yeah. In that case, how do you finish? So, very good question. Um, if you use your meat spoon with milk on it, you have to just really rinse it off because we're just concerned with the external residue. However, do not make the mistake of rinsing it off in hot water because if you now put hot water on it, that hot water will smash that milk into your meat spoon. So rinse it off in cold water, probably if you have two sinks, if you have that luxury, put it over the milk sink because you're spilling milk off into that sink. Rinse it off in cold water and then just inspect. I mean, you see milk, if, it, if you do it right away and you don't wait until it's sitting on the counter for three weeks and it got it's not coagulated on it, then it'll be able to rinse off pretty quickly and you could wipe it with a towel if you want also. If it's very fatty milk, maybe double check there's no fat on it, but generally that's, that's not a problem. Okay, so there's really, there's five parts of this process, five potential processes that can uh, induce the transfer of taste. So let's just start with number one. Number one is probably the most classic example, and that is heat, which means if something is hot, that can cause taste to get transferred. Like we said, the classic case, you're cooking, uh, you're cooking you, for, you took the wrong pot out of the, out of the pantry, and you're cooking milk inside of a meat pot. So now, as soon as you pour the milk and nothing happens, everything's cold. Take it out and rinse it out. Once it gets hot, so now um, it, becomes, it becomes a problem because the taste of the milk can now get embedded in the pot, and the pot can now have milk and meat flavor, and the previous meat flavor of the pot can now come out and get cooked into the milk. So what is the temperature that's considered hot? So the Gemara, the, the Code of Jewish Law says, the temperature is called, in Hebrew, Yad Solet Espo, which means Yad is a hand. A hand will retract when it touches this temperature. It means it's hot enough that if you touch it, you'll, you'll, you'll jump back from it. There's a dispute amongst the rabbis exactly how to quantify that into a, into a degree. So for sure, the most uh, strict opinion is 110 degrees Fahrenheit. For sure, if it's less than that, it's for sure, for sure fine. The range is like between 110 and 150. Generally, whenever you have one of these questions, just call a rabbi if something comes up, a mistake happens, you make sure that it happens all the time. Just ask someone. And, um, but for sure, if it was cold, then you, don't, you, don't, you know, everyone knows now, you don't even have to ask, just rinse it off and it's fine, yeah. So if you're eating outside in the middle of summer in Dallas, can you touch your milk? <laughs> Stop. You're saying because you're meat? No, because it's over 110 degrees. But with, with what? With a meaty thing, you're saying? Well, it's your hand. Your hand. Well, it's only going to be... So, right, it's a... Your hand... It's a good question. Well, I'll ask you a better question, yeah? Can you drink a hot cup of coffee because your lip touches it? You're not kosher. I can't eat your right? Cannibalism is forbidden in the Torah. Yeah, so, you're maybe you're cooking your flavor of your lips into your coffee. I mean, right. ideally, when you drink the coffee, it's not so hot, but... No, it's a great question. There, there's there's response on this topic. The generally understood t- uh, answer to this is, is that living creatures don't give off taste. It's like a rule. Taste that comes from from no longer living. Living creatures don't. Therefore, if you want to jump in a pot of hot water, you know, knock yourself out. Um, outside, normal be problem because it's hot outside, but it doesn't actually affect the food and the thing it's on. It take a real long time for it to actually actually get hot. But um, okay, so that is the main inducer. We'll get to the application of this in a second. But um, again, if it's not this hot, the only concern is the residue left behind. So again, if it's milk or if it's, if it's like cheese or cottage cheese, it can be a little uh, you know, oily or whatever. You maybe take a sponge, wipe it off a little just to make sure it all gets off. But again, we're just concerned here with external residue remaining on the, on the item. Second... Would you use milk or sponge or... Yeah, so you would use a milk one, meaning you're treating this basically as a milk one. You would use a milk sponge to clean it because right now, again, not in hot water. If it's not in hot water, nothing's going to come out of your, of your, let's say, spoon, your meat spoon, and there's milk on it, so you want to keep that milk in the milk sink with the milk sponge. Just wipe it off, and then, you know, afterwards you can put it back where it was. Another user is called soaking. So the general rule with soaking is that um, it has to sit in the liquid for 24 hours for taste to get transferred, which would mean that in a normal scenario where you, uh, <coughs> where you put, um, let's say you put your, whatever, put your milk, you left your flesh, you, you didn't clean up after breakfast, and you used that meat spoon in your cereal and milk, and you forgot to clean up that bowl, so now your, your, uh, 
meat spoon is sitting soaking inside of your milk. So if it would sit there for 24 hours, that would be a problem. The tra- taste would now get transferred into that spoon, and that could be a problem. Additionally, by sharp, sharp liquids, like for example, if it's uh, if something is soaking in, this is actually a picture of vinegar, if you're wondering. I'll try to find it. It's hard to know we're looking at it, but evidently that's vinegar, according to Google Images. Um, if it's soaking in a sharp liquid like vinegar or alcohol or something like that, then it would be as quick as 18 minutes, which would be a problem if, for example, you have a fork that you use to jab pickles out of your pickle jar with, and it's a meat fork, and you leave it in there for just for the beginning of the meal until the end of the meal, so it could make that all the pickles now become, it could potentially make that all the pickles become um, meaty. Just, again, that's just to preface one thing here. When we say you have a meat spoon or a meat fork, your meat spoon or meat fork can only become, act, it's only actual meaty, not by designating because we put it on that side of the kitchen and we call it a meat fork. It's going to be a meat fork if it was used with hot meat, right? So if it wasn't actually used with hot meat, like for example, drinking glasses are very rarely used with anything hot. So even though maybe you'll have, you know, a meat set of drinking glasses and a milk set of drinking glasses, they're both really parv in real life because you've basically never really used them ever with anything hot. So just whenever we're talking about an item, you have to know, is it, even though we designated it as such, just remember, is it, you know, have you ever actually used that for something hot of that type? But again, soaking again, stuff so for regular items would be 24 hours for, um, for, uh, meat, for sharp items would be 18, 18 uh, minutes. Again, this is another issue with keeping your kitchen clean. You know, if you have a soak, if you're soaking, you have one of those uh, little tubs that you put your dirty dishes in, and yes, you have a milk one and a meat one, and you're soaking your milk in one, and all of a sudden you find that you know, there's a piece of meat somehow got inside of your milk one. So if it was soaking there for 24 hours, it could cause a problem there. Which is, again, another advantage. These things just wouldn't come up if you keep it clean, which, if that's possible, great. If not, then be careful and try not to let the meat and the milk in. And if it does, it's not a big deal. Don't stress. Call the rabbi. It's all good. The, the third way, we had heat, we had soaking. The third way is salting. Salting is really not at all practical for us nowadays. We talk about salting, we're talking about like when you're making the meat kosher, we said previously you have to salt the meat. We're talking about when you're like heaping salt and putting like relative to the mass, like 50% salt um, to the object. So in a regular kitchen, when you have some salty food, that would never really cause a real salt transfer in general. (laughs) If it was something that was very, very salty, it could be a problem, even if it's not that much. If it's just very salty to the taste, I would ask a question, but this is probably not going to come up too often. The fourth type is aroma, which, um, <coughs> now, aroma is also not the most practical of transfers, because aroma is only when two things are both being cooked open, so you have a meat pan and a milk pan cooking in the oven, in a closed area, and both are being cooked open at the same time. If not for that, then aroma won't be an issue. So it's only if you were to put in your oven at the same time an open meat dish and an open milk dish, which would definitely not be recommended for other reasons as well. So once we're not doing that, even if you were to put one in after the other one, which we'll get to in a second, aroma wouldn't be a problem. Aroma is a very limited problem. That's really only if it's in the, the same space and they're both open, which shouldn't come up very frequently. And the fifth one, which is probably the, the second most problematic after the first one of heat, is steam. Um, we generally view steam as the exact same as the liquid itself, which means that if you have this pot and it's cooking, this steam is the same meat or milk status as whatever's being cooked in this pot. So if you have, I don't know, salamis hanging on top of your stove top or something like that, so then that could be a problem if you have milk steam going up over those hanging slimes, right? Because steam also, we'll get to in a second, ovens and stoves, but where steam can go and the problem steam can cause, but steam is considered the same as the item it's cooking, and therefore it could be a <coughs> a problem with um with that, both by milk and by meat. Um, <coughs> again, steam is only going to transfer the taste if it's hot. Steam works with the mechanism of heat, because if you have something that is, so you have steam and you have your salami and really high up, so it reaches the salami, but it's cold by the time it gets there, so then it won't, Im- it'll, you have to rinse it off, but it won't embed itself in unless it's hot. But generally, things that are close by to the stove, steam is hot when it comes out of the pot, generally. Okay, that's really the basic background information for the, to understand how taste transfers. 
in practical life, there's really three, I would say three things. Things can touch, that could be a problem, um, which is normally a problem of either heat or steam. And again, these are only going to be a problem when you have generally a liquid medium there. Steam would be liquid or a fatty piece of meat or something like that. Okay, any questions on up to here before we go into the practical kitchen itself trying to apply these uh, ideas? Everything makes sense? Okay, fantastic. So let's start with perhaps the most complex one, which is an oven. All of those who don't know what I'm talking about, there you go. Now, um, again, if you're... I don't want to single anyone out. If... <laughs> If you're able to, it's for sure a luxury to have two of everything in your kosher kitchen. You can have two microwaves and two stoves and two ovens and two sinks and two counters. And If you're able to have that, that's amazing. It's wonderful. It'll probably save you questions, save you times of calling the rabbi and save you issues. But in most situations, it's not necessary. Um, and so we need to know it's also not practical. So we need to know how to use our space properly. If you have a two-chamber oven, which this one is here, I've never really seen these in America. In Israel, a lot of people had two-chamber ovens. Um, this picture is an American picture, but I don't, I've never seen anyone's kitchen here that I've been in their house that has one of these. If you do have a two-chamber oven, which if you wanted to set up a kosher kitchen and you were planning everything, you know, it's a fine option because you have two separate ovens. This is basically fine. Um, it's possible that generally they have two vents and they both go out separately and they don't air between each other at all because that's the way each one cooks properly. I guess if you could, you could double check that before you buy one if you were buying one. But this is an option for anyone who's planning on buying a new one if you could buy them in America, I mean, I think you could, then it's the easiest way to avoid anything with ovens. Um, fine. Second easiest way is, this is what I have always done. We just moved. Now we have a very nice kitchen with two ovens, which is very pleasant. We would like cook pizza and like the oven. What we always used to do was we had an oven. We just kept our oven meaty and we had like a little toaster oven and we, we weren't as big on the milk dishes as the meat dishes in general. So we just used our milk in the toaster oven in general. Which is an easy option, also. But now we're uh, we have two, and we're very very happy about that. Everyone's invited for milk or meat, separately, <laughs> not together. Um, so again, so you have an oven. So you want to use ovens. What are the potential problems with the uh, with the oven? So the main problem with the oven is that you cook. Let's say you cooked meat in it, and now there's stuff left behind in the oven, intentionally, unintentionally. Things can spill or splatter. Um, again, steam can rise if you're cooking it open to the top of the oven internal top of the oven. It can embed taste there that can again later get pulled down by something else. Or sometimes it just leaves the residue there. Sometimes if you after you cook something you take a tissue and just wipe the top of it, you see it's like a greasy, it's fatty. It's just there's like a some juices from the meat gets cooked up there. So now if you put in your milk dish right afterwards, if that milk dish would steam up again, it can, you know, get that part wet again and pull down either that grease or the taste embedded there potentially. As well as if your meat spilled over onto the racks, your racks can have meaty grease on them, and then that could be touching your pan or whatever it is, your pot of milk that you're putting in. So these are probably the two main um, potential potential problems. So what's the best way to use an oven for two things? So an oven is probably the most basic thing we'll need to figure out how to use for both of them. Everyone needs, at one point or another, to use ovens. So the the smartest thing to do is to determine within yourself, within your couple, what's your primary function of your oven? Meaning, make a, a default position. Is this going to be by default milk, or is this going to be by default meat? And then we're going to always work with that default. So what do we have here? We'll, we'll t take an example, but we'll base it on the majority. We have three couples, so one of them has one. Do you, are you generally uh, cooking meat dishes or milk dishes in your oven? More meat. More meat. Yeah. Meat. It doesn't even matter anymore because you guys are outvoted. But <laughs> it's meat? It's meat. Okay, I think most people probably use milk. Generally, I don't know. It's just it's not the same. You cook it on your stovetop a lot. It's not always in the oven. Ovens are probably more chicken than meat. So let's say our oven is default meat, which means that we're going to cook meat in our ovens freely however we want. We don't have to think about it. It's a meat oven. We can open, close, however you want, meaning, the, meaning covered, uncovered. Open, close, I meant covered, uncovered. However you want to use your oven for that default position, go ahead and um, use your oven. Now let's say you have this meaty oven, which you've actually cooked chicken and meat in, and now you want to go ahead and you want to use it for milk. So what do we do? Just so, need, like, just clean the oven? Well, self-cleaning mode you're talking yeah. about. Ah, so okay. self-cleaning mode, that's for sure. Self-cleaning anything gets rid of all issues. We'll get there in one second. So 
if you have, if you want, there's there's two, there's really two options. Let's say that's either you can re kosher your whole oven and make it back to a new status, or you can leave it as is meat and figure out how to cook milk in it. Two potential problems, right? So let's go with the first one first. Let's say you want to leave your oven as meat. You don't want to kosher your oven again, so you're going to leave it as meaty, but you want to cook a milk dish in it. So the only way to do this is to avoid those two problems we said before. Which again, one problem is the racks. So all you have to do is really take a piece of aluminum foil. Recommended to take two because it tears a lot. Um, take two pieces of aluminum foil, cover the rack. Now there's not going to be any meaty residue that's going to be touching your pot. And even if it's there, it's going to be dry between the foil and your pot. So there will be no problem with the rack to your pot. And now the steam, this would only work if you're going to cover your milk covered. If your milk is covered, meaning covered well enough that no steam will exit this pot or this pan, whatever you're, you're cooking in, this dish, so then you're fine because, again, your, your rack is covered, can't, nothing's hitting the rack, and your lid is covered that no steam can come out of it, so it's not going to pull anything off the top, it's going to cook itself internally. You could do that for anything that works to be covered... Um, um, that works to be cooked covered. The, you know, the problem with this sometimes is the pressure cooking. It could blow the thing open a little bit. It can cause problems. If that does happen, you can ask a question. That's um, the only problem with it. And the other problem with it is a lot of things need to be cooked open. So it's just not always an option. So again, when you cover it, you have to make sure that it's actually well covered around, not just like a little thing over it where the steam can still go up and down. Um, so the other option is to kosher your oven. So the easiest option, like Mark and Denise said before, if you have a self-cleaning oven, we spoke at the end of the last class about how there's two processes of koshering items. You can either put them in boiling water, or you can um, put, uh, make them open to intense heat. The level of heat in any self-cleaning oven is, oven is for sure above and beyond whatever that requirement is. And therefore, if you have a, say, a default meat oven, you say you want to cook milk in it, you can just push the, push the self-clean mode. Have it run. When it's done, it is now undetermined again. It can be used for either milk or meat now. And now you just put your milk in it and cook your milk. Now, as a just as a smart thing to do again, is part of the purpose of creating the default is if we don't switch it back to the default when we're done, we're going to end up putting meat in it by mistake and just forget about it. So if you're planning on doing like a one-time cooking of milk, the smartest thing to do is after you finish cooking that milk and you're done, hit it again and always set it back to the default. You generally want to leave it at whatever you decided the default is because you're just going to assume later. You're going to wake up the next morning. You're going to forget, oh, I want to cook meat in it. You're going to forget you made a milk. So it's just, it's smarter to, you know, return to the default position afterwards. That would uh, just be the easiest thing to do. Now, let's say you don't have a um, self-cleaning oven. So what do you do? So what you have to do now is you have to clean the inside of your oven as well as you can. Just, you know, scrub the top, make sure there's no grease anywhere, make sure there's nothing on it. Um, ideally, wait after it's, not after it's clean, but wait, once you clean it, in addition to cleaning it, wait 24 hours since you've last used it for meat, if that's what you're doing. Because this is not as, since you're not burning it out like you do in the other process, this is more similar to um, kosher it through boiling. It's, it's comparable to that camp, which is the last time you have to let it sit for 24 hours. So you let it sit for 24 hours, and then you turn it on to the highest heat setting that your oven can do for an hour. So it hits that setting, it stays for a little bit, roughly an hour, and um, once that's done, that oven is now considered kosher. You can use it for milk, for the other type if you'd like. And again, when you're done with that, you could just revert it back to the same process, just clean it. That'd be an easy cleaning process now. Clean it quickly, let it sit till the next day, and then... Um, just put it back again and set it back as a default. That's just a smart idea because if we don't reset it, we just tend to forget that we didn't reset it. Um, that's really the basic of ovens. It would be the same thing with um, a broiler. If you have a broiler on the top shelf of your oven and you use the top of it for that, it's the same issues again. The issues are steam up and down again. So same process again as the oven. Anything you're putting in that oven has the same process. Okay, that is ovens. Is that is that clear? What, what do you people have? Do you have self-cleaning ovens? Do you have... You have self cleaning? Is there self cleaning or not? Self cleaning? You have self cleaning? You don't know. Oh, you have two ovens. You have, oh, so you have a milk and meat oven, so that's then you're then you're uh, easier off. Okay, fine. So then that's all extra information. Everyone can tell their friends. But um, self clean is the easiest way to go, and two different ones are even easier than that.
Um, okay, perfect. Moving on. The next item in our kitchens are microwaves. So microwaves are complicated because microwaves um, tend to splatter much more than, uh, than um, stoves do. I never believed that, and then today God showed me it. I put a little thing of, uh, <laughs> of like, I think it was like uh, chili beans or something like that, like put one in the microwave, I, like turned on for a minute, and like, I opened it up. Like the whole thing was like covered in brown. I'm like, what happened? It was crazy, but uh, it does splatter a lot more, and there's certain ve- the venting systems are harder to clean. Microwaves tend to be very hard to clean and to kosher. It's definitely not recommended to be switching back and forth between milk and meat and microwaves. If you have a non-kosher microwave because you weren't keeping kosher and now you're making a kosher kitchen and Rabbi Klein's going to come and he's going to um, make your kitchen kosher, he's not, he probably won't tell you to get a new microwave, not sure. Probably make yours kosher as a one-time thing to clean it well and to make it invest it well. We would do it, but microwaves are not so expensive and they're not so big. And um, it's just for sure recommended to have two of them just because of the complications in cleaning well. Um, if anyone does need to make theirs kosher... We can uh, just ask me, I'll tell you how. I don't think it's necessary to do it unless everyone wants to. And it's just, I think, TMI, you know? Okay, so. Is it different than koshering it for Pesach? Koshering it for Pesach, I don't think most people would do at all. I think just because, unless I'm wrong. I don't know. I wouldn't. Um, um, I don't know. I should, you could ask uh, or climb or climb. Generally, koshering things for Pesach are more stringent than they are during the year because since um, the laws of Pesach Chomet, Generally, we mentioned last class is a concept called bittel, which is nullification. So nullification um, is generally assumed to be one part to 60 parts, which means if I have 60 units of chicken soup and one unit relative to the units we're talking about of milk falls in, so we'll say that is nullified. You can't taste it in the world of halacha and Jewish law. It doesn't exist. And Pesach, there's a stringency by chametz. That chametz is never bottle, Even if it's one in a thousand, even if it's a small amount, it's um it's never bought. So things like microwaves are very very hard to clean. Um, it could be people would be lenient. Ask uh, whoever you ask your questions to. The people I've been around um, generally are hesitant to to clean microwaves that because because even if there's a little bit of chametz left in it, it could be a problem. If you were to kosher it, it's not hard to kosher them. It's just hard to know that you really did it 100. percent That's why on right, Pesach so it's more of a scary thing because. Pesach, uh, or at least what I was taught, whether you still have to have everything covered during Pesach, but in order to kosher it, you microwaved water for 10 minutes. Yeah, so that's the process. The, way, the process of microwaving water is, I mean, the fear of a microwave is that it things steam up in it. So the way you kosher it, because last time, easy in, easy out, right? If, you, if it became infused a taste with steam, so you take a cup of water, you put it in there for however long it takes for the water to steam out, and we say just like it became embedded with taste through the steam, it, it also comes out with the steam. That's the general principle, which is what you would do, like if we're make your kitchen kosher, if a client comes in, that's what he's going to do to make it kosher in that sense. Just specifically, um, certain microwaves are very hard to get all of the things out of, especially in the venting system, which could get hot also and transit back and forth. Therefore, I think there may be a stringency by Pesach, but again, there are for sure people that wouldn't spies me or lenient, and it um, definitely could be. Moving on, we have toasters. So when I say toasters, what I normally refer to, could be referred to a little thing with bread that pops up. If you refer to the thing that bread pops up, it's probably not milk or dairy. I mean, uh, dairy or meat. I'm not sure what you would put meat inside of it. It's probably parv. I guess there's certain milk things like pancakes or something like that maybe you'd put inside of it, but you can't really clean them, so I would just leave those as milk if that's what you have. Toasters like these also um, are very hard to clean. Once things, if you have like a pristine one like this, maybe it's easier. But generally, they get dirty and things spill and splatter, and they're also very hard to clean. Um, it's not so recommended to really have them shared for milk and meat. Again, it's recommended to just keep it as as one thing. If that's an issue when anyone needs is in a duress and needs to change that, so talk to the rabbi, we can deal with it. Barbecue grills. Barbecue grills are impossible to clean. Um, they have grease on them from years and years of meat. They're really, really hard to clean. The grease on the bottom, there is a fire there, and the fire theoretically should consume everything, but practically, if you look at your grills, it just doesn't always work like that. Also, the thing on the bottom that catches the grease often, unless you remove that, that's full of grease. It's it's basically, I mean, it's possible. And for sure, again, if you'd want to make it kosher, you took this grate off and you stuck it in your self-cleaning oven, that would for sure be fine, because that would kosher would be no worse. But um, generally, it's not really practical to to make a grill kosher. Most people tend to have the default position on grills as being meaty. 
Um, if anyone has milk as a default, we should talk about that separately. But um, the other thing just to be wary of is um, we mentioned in the past that there's, you're not supposed to eat meat and fish together also. So if you were to grill salmon, salmon shouldn't really be grilled on the same grill as meat, and there's no real way to really clean it unless you have like another grate or something like that, and underneath it is clean. So that could be another potential... Uh, what if you heat it up? Try it. It just doesn't work. For some, I mean, if you, if you scrub the, the grease off really well and it was clean, and again, the bottom of it was... Meaning when you have a fire on this grate, it's not actually focusing fire on each of these grates intensely. It's like when you close the top of it, it creates a certain cooking temperature that allows things to cook in it. But it's not really like directly... Like we'll see by the stove top, the fire generally is like directly, constantly koshering the grate on top of the stove. Because there's a fire like burning on that grate the whole time. On these, there's, there's not normally a fire like on each of these grates constantly that we can assume that that fire is going to constantly be like burning everything off. So barbecue grills are, um, are again, not so recommended. Yeah? What if you had a piece of fish and you wrapped it really, really good in Right. So again, this is the problem of, of touching it being on top of it. If you wrapped it in foil or you just put a piece of foil underneath it, I don't know how well that would work in terms of the barbecue. I mean, I'm, I'm not such a professional barbecuer. I feel like that would like would that work in terms of like being a good barbecue? Yeah, it's good? Okay, I don't know. So again, just make sure that your fish juice try to make avoid your fish juices like dripping down from it also, because that could cause a problem from when you put meat on next and you have your fish juices there also, that'll then be a problem the next step. So but yeah, for sure. If you have a sealed thing, again recommended to put two sheets of tin foil down just because these things tend to have problems. But um yeah, if you did that then that would be fine. Um, I didn't know that works. That works, huh? Salmon, what do you, what do, you do? You put salmon inside of... A bunch of vegetables and like a piece of fish and wrap it up and forget about it and it's a great meal. And it's better than doing that same thing in an oven. Like barbecue girls work better on that. Okay, well, they got to try it. Sounds good. Specifically salmon or it's any fish? Any fish. Any fish. All right. Pins and scales. Um, stove tops. <laughs> stove tops are next. Um, stove tops are probably the second most complicated after um, after ovens. Most commonly is again, if you have two stove tops, perfect. You can have one for your meat, one for your milk, and you shouldn't have issues. If you have only one stove top, which many people do, so again, you have to be careful now because things generally tend to be hot by the stove top and things generally tend to be dirty. I don't mean dirty, I mean like have stuff inside of them when they're by the stove top. So this would be a problem if you have milk and meat, let's say you were cooking milk over here and meat over here, I mean, things boil over or you're stirring it and, you know, a noodle of macaroni and cheese flies out when you're stirring. These things happen all the time. This is why, in general, it's recommended, if possible, to avoid having both meat and milk, pots and pans or dishes, on the stove at the same time. There's nothing inherently wrong with it. You could do it. It's just, again, the cleaner and most more organized and way things are, it'll just avoid issues if you're able to keep your... Your milk and meat separate. Um, <coughs> also, if you have like a short pot here and a tall pot here, theoretically your short pot can steam onto your tall pot next to it, depending on how closely they are, which if one is one type and one the other, again, that could be a problem. If you realize afterwards, oh my gosh, there's a, a meat pot there and a milk pot there and I didn't realize, if you didn't see anything happen, you don't have to suspect anything happened, you don't have to be paranoid about it. The halacha is, the law is, is that unless you see something go wrong, we assume everything is fine. So therefore, even if you didn't mean to do it like this, whatever happened, nothing splattered that you know of, nothing changed that you know of. You even found a milk spoon in your meat drawer and you have no clue how it got there. It doesn't matter because you could just assume whenever you picked it up, spaced out, put it in the wrong drawer. Unless you know something happened, you don't have to be concerned anything happened. So again, no worries there. Um, now, the question is, how do we cook both meat and milk, even one after the other, on the stovetop? So the grates themselves... Now, this is a gas burner, which by electric burners are even easier because this whole part gets red hot, or some people have like the metal coil electric burners. When those, what, what kind of burners do you have? We'll just talk about the kind of it has less much. You have the right side, yeah. like that kind of electric or the, yeah. okay, and what do you, kind do you guys have? We have coil, but we're going to buy gas. You have coil, electric coil, and you're going to get gas. Okay, so we have to talk about it all the times, so we got all three. What do you guys have? You have two, no? We've got gas. You have gas. Okay, so let's talk about uh, whatever, both of these are practical then. So the grates themselves, now grates are really utensil, right? So if chicken soup spills over onto the grates, these grates should now be a meat utensil. 
So how could I put my milk pot on top of these grates once these grates just had chicken soup on them? So the grates, once the fire has been on these grates, you leave the fire on. So your fire tends to burn off whatever's on the grates. And your fire basically keeps these grates constantly being koshered. And therefore, they're going to end up being parv almost always. If as soon as it's spilled over, you turned it off, that you shouldn't do that. You should leave it on for a few seconds just to let it burn it off and kosher what's ever on it. So the grates tend to not be a problem. And you can use the same grates, meaning some people, there are people in the world that will say, well, use these two for me and milk. You don't have to do that. If you want to do that again, the more care you want to take, probably the less questions you'll have, but there's no need to do that. So the grates are going to be fine because they're going to kosher themselves. But when your chicken soup spills, this area here is going to get dirty. Now again, if you clean that part off right away, so then there'll be nothing left there, it'll be clean, and that's fine. The only potential problem would be if your milk fell on it afterwards, maybe you shouldn't eat it if your actual food fell on it. But assuming that you just have a pot on top of it, and that area underneath is clean, so it's fine because there's nothing there. But if you left your chicken soup underneath and you didn't clean it up right away, and there's like a little pool of chicken soup, and then you put your milk pot on top of it and you turn the fire on, so you'll notice that fire will start to heat up that little pool of soup underneath it, and that soup will steam into the bottom of your pot. So therefore, the only things you really have to be concerned about, that would obviously be a problem. Um, the only thing you have to be concerned about really is keeping the part clean underneath it, that it shouldn't have the other type of it there. Meaning if there's burnt stuff there, it's fine. It's not food. We're talking about when there's actual food remains residue underneath it that could potentially then steam back up to a different type of pot on top of it. And again, this is why it's, to, um, it's much easier to clean things up when they happen than later. It's just always true. Everything's easier to wash when it's fresh. So it's just, it's just the reality. But you can do it whenever. And again, there's no problem if you don't do it for another week. It's just... That would create more likely uh, problems if you put the wrong, the wrong part on top of it. Um, <coughs> okay, I think that's it. Um, these types of things. So, on an electric stove top, these generally get red hot. And this does the equivalent of koshering itself. Also, I mean, what, what happens here when that gets red hot, that will keep itself constantly being koshered. Also, and anything that spills on this part will be totally fine. We have the same problem again. Something spills over here, this part could become meaty over here because this part tends to also get somewhat hot. And then if afterwards, you know, some noodles fall on here, so you just should throw out those few noodles and probably not eat them. Or you can call someone and ask if it's significant because there are variables to that. But that would be the only potential problem would be if something fell over here. Here you won't have the problem of steam underneath it because there's no, like, uh, area below. So you're kind of easier off with uh, that kind of stove top. So what do you do if you have... And not that we have one. one of the inductive stoves. How does it work? They stay cool unless you put metal on them, and the metal heats up. I don't know. That's cool. How do they work? Are those common? I never, heard, I never heard of that before. They're, they're new. How do you do? You set a setting on it. For what? I mean, how hot do you? How how you sort of how hot you want it to get, and then yeah, only the metal senses it. Only pots can get hot. <laughs> like they have a thing where they cut a pot. In the, only the pot gets hot. You're saying. So if your like kid crack- takes like a tissue and puts it on the grate. It wouldn't get hot. It wouldn't, nothing would happen. They have an image of like, they take a pan, cut it in half, put an egg on it, the part that's on the pot cooks, and the part that's off the pot does. That's very cool. Um, I mean, if it stays cold, then taste probably won't get embedded in it, so you'd be, I guess, better off in a certain sense. I mean, anything underneath it, I don't know how it would, if it wouldn't heat up, I don't know, would the pot be hot enough to heat it up? I guess it'd be a practical question. If the heat, if the heat of the pot can uh, create a large enough heat to cause those to go up, then that would be a problem. Uh, if not, probably you'd be better off with that, I guess. But uh, that's cool. What's it called again? An inductive stove. An inductive stove side. Okay, cool. Um, okay, counters. Counters, again, like everything else in the kitchen. If you have two of them, great. Makes it easier. Here's our picture, and our beautiful picture of all our kosher series. They have nice two counters here, one on each side. You just make one meat, one milk, and life is easy like that. So you make a mistake, but generally easier. Let's say you only have one counter space area. So, again, counters are not practical to constantly kosher back and forth. You could, most countertops, again, we mentioned last time, not every material can be koshered, but most can. And most countertops you could kosher if you uh, need to. Um, but once you kosher them, it's not practical to keep changing them. So, again, the smartest idea would be if you only have one, you can choose one default for it, whatever you normally need it for, for meat, and then you can just, you know, 
put meat on that counter and not worry about it. And if you want to use it for milk, just, you know, lie a towel down underneath it or a trivet or any of these types of things, and that will just save it from touching it. There's no real problems of steam, no problems of heat here generally. The problem is just of um, residue or something on the counter itself. So as long as your counters are clean, you shouldn't put hot milk and hot meat on it. You should choose one, put the other one on a, on a towel. But generally, for sure, ex post facto will be fine if everything was clean. Because again, it's generally not wet. There's no liquid between them. And therefore, even if the pot is hot, ideally, you shouldn't do it, but it'll almost always be fine ex post facto. Um, yeah, that's basically um, the deal with counters. There's a few just general kitchen... Uh, Concerns, I guess I would say. I don't know if it's really concerns. But, um, number one, so spice shakers. Spice shakers are interesting. If you pour your spices directly over your soup, so then some suggest that steam is going to go right into your spice shakers, in which case they can make that spice shaker meaty. Not all agree to that. But, um, ideally, you could pour some, if you pour the spices on your hand and put it in, it's preferred. If not, don't worry about it. Just another. So there are those that are careful for that. Um, the other thing is, we mentioned before, some people keep utensils suspended above. I said salami is my, exa- as my example before, but probably more common is utensils and stuff. And if you're keeping utensils um, behind it, so that could be a concern. If you have meat utensils here, and you're cooking hot cocoa in the back over here, I mean, you could easily steam onto that. So just something you might not have thought of, just to bring, bring it to the forefront that could potentially be um, a problem. I should say washing dishes. Washing dishes or a dishwasher. So, let's say you're uh, washing dishes. So, we mentioned already, the way you think taste gets transferred in the dishwashing sense would be through heat. So, if you have your water on very, very hot, I, I can't put my hand in hot water. I get very, like, sensitive to it. Some people can, like, my mother could put her hand in like 500 degree water. I don't know how she does it. But um, anyways, different people are sensitive to different amounts. If your water is extremely hot when you're cooking it, generally if your hands are inside of it, it won't be extremely hot. Um, some people wear gloves. I've heard. Never seen. But I've done some people wear gloves and they wash dishes. If you do that, then the water might be really hot. If you're using very, very hot water, so then you could have a problem if you were washing milk and meat dishes together in the sink at the same time. Because if they're both dirty... You have, you know, a bowl of your milk bowl, and you have your other meat dishes there also, and you're pouring boiling hot water in, so that could create a hot environment for both milk and meat. So ideally, we should have separate places. Not if you wash in the same sink, but like have separate like basins like this, something like that, for milk and meat. And um, even if you're going to wash them in the same sink, you should rinse like a uh, do one of them, and then afterwards make sure there's no like meat chunks or residue in the sink because if you drop your spoon in it and it falls on a piece of meat with hot water there, that could be a problem. So just do one and then the other one. Also, um, that's, uh, <coughs> that's if you're washing the dishes. Dishwashers um, are also they're very hard to, to change. They're kind of like microwaves. If you need to make them kosher once, you can clean them really well. You could run a cycle on high and you can make them kosher. I know my client, when he comes, if he comes to kosher your home, he, will, he won't tell you you need to get a new dishwasher. He'll make it kosher. But in a practical day-to-day sense of switching back and forth between milk and meat, it's generally not practical to cook, um, not to cook, but to wash both your milk and your meat, even in different rinse cycles in the same dishwasher. Because the, unless someone told me what, someone wants to ask me a question, can I use it for milk and for meat if my dishes are all clean when they go in? I said, the dishes are all clean when they go in. Why are you washing them? The dishes are... Well, they're not, like, sparkly and clean. They're just, like, you know, I rinsed them off and I scrubbed them already once. I'm like, you can do whatever you want. Enjoy. But, um, but generally, I don't know, we at least put dirty dishes in our dishwasher. If you put dirty dishes in your dishwasher, that often has meaty residue and stuff remaining behind, so it's not recommended to, um, to use them separately. Okay, any questions? Oh, refrigerators. That was the last thing. You asked about refrigerators. So again, refrigerators tend to be a little bit easier because refrigerators tend to be cold most of the time. You're not supposed to, um, nothing to do with Judaism, put hot things. Even if you want to put your soup in the fridge, 
They recommend the refrigerator companies recommend not putting them in hot because it's bad for the mechanism and forces it to overwork too much. So generally, we're not putting in very hot items in the refrigerator. So it won't be a problem in terms of practical transfers. The only thing that might happen in refrigerators is what we mentioned before is soaking. If you didn't realize you had some kind of you know chicken soup there and you didn't realize your cheese fell off, fell off the shelf and someone ended up inside of your chicken soup, and then if you didn't notice it, it's probably not so common, but something could fall off and end up in the wrong place. If it would soak there for 24 hours, that could potentially be a problem. Um, also, just residue, if things are open in them, or they're just, you know, the pot wasn't totally clean, there was some residue on the side, and that's next to something milk, just be concerned for that residue. So again, the main thing is just to be careful and try to keep them separate as possible. Most people don't have two refrigerators. Most people just have one and kind of keep the things separate. And again, even if they were to touch in this type of situation and get dirty, all it would really necessitate would be to rinse it off in cold water and get the residue off. So that that um, wouldn't be such a uh, problem of kosher. I mean, there's no like, major issue. They have to like, kosher your pot or put in boiling water. Those tend to not be a problem with refrigerators. Okay, I think uh, I've, I've exhausted all the parts of the kitchen that I've thought of. If there's other parts to your kitchen that you usually have questions about, questions or anything else that you want to know about, please. Yeah. All right, so if we have a one stainless steel sink, and we don't... A single one. Right. Well, no, no, two, two bowls, but... You have two I containers. Have, right, I should have two. put a picture. I have a picture of that in there. Okay, two containers. And we don't want it to be just tray. We don't want the... the one second, you have... It's one piece, but there's two bowls, so to speak, with a wall between them? Correct. Yeah. Okay, oh, no, like this. Like yeah. One is the it's a double sink. Right, right, like, exactly. Okay. We have, we have yeah. Thing. So... We're not a big milk family. Generally, we do disposable for milk, so it's not really an issue. But if we were to get milk dishes, could we cover one side and have it not be considered trick? Yeah, so even if they're connected in this situation, mm -hmm. it's normally going to be fine because the metal in the middle is never going to get hot. Meaning, taste is not going to be able to transfer from one side to the other side. Because let's say you, the way taste generally transfers is It'll go through it, right? The, the meat will fall on one side of it, and it'll have to tra travel through that metal to the other side of it. So the way that could be a problem, I think, is the dishwasher. Because the dishwasher can back hot water back up through it. Oh, right. I mean, generally, water that backs up. That, that was your question. There's a few different parts to the sink, right? For the sink, generally, you could have, even if it's one piece, you could have one part milk, one part meat. Mm -hmm. Don't be a problem. Again, try to be careful for splashing. I think that's what, again, if you want to cover it, that's for sure the an easier option. And then... You don't have to worry about it. Generally, water that backs up, maybe the dishwasher is very hot, I don't know. Well, generally, water that backs up from sinks are, don't tend to be yeah, still let us anymore. Sure. They don't tend to be 110 you know, to degrees hot. They're normally cool, cooler by then. Even if they went in that hot, they're not that hot when they come back up, so it's normally not a problem. Um, if dishwashers are different, I don't know, I never, I don't know of it being different. Yeah. But if they keep the heat better or something like that and it comes up hotter, it could be a problem. But again, dishwashers, we, we'd anyways recommend to just have it uniquely for. For one thing. Right, right. So. Wait, okay, and technically, the dishwasher. Can you actually, can you, can you can kasha a plastic tub dishwasher? If your house is not currently kosher and you want to have a kosher kitchen, for sure the opinion of the DK is they're going to come in and they will kosher your dishwasher, including the plastic parts and every part of it will all be kosher. Yeah, they can, you can do that. Okay. To constantly do that back and forth, there's a general principle, I forgot to mention this, a general principle that we try not to kosher things from milk and meat back and forth. Like even utensils, you have a spoon, you try not to switch them back and forth, even though you could just take it to boiling water, use it for the other. The rabbis are concerned you're going to forget when you just used it yesterday. So, then, so things that aren't absolutely necessary, like an oven, you, you need to be able to go back and forth because people don't always have to, to use. Things that aren't necessary, and especially things that are very, very hard to clean, and, you know, it's questionable how well you can kosher it. So if you need to kosher it, we'll say, fine, you can kosher it. But to do that constantly back and forth wouldn't be, wouldn't be recommended. Yeah? Is milk in general considered kosher? Does it have to, are there, like, special kosherings for milk? Like, if I go to 7-Eleven and get a gallon of milk. Yeah, so general milk is, is considered kosher as long as it's cow milk on it. There's an interesting case it is in a... Cow milk, yeah. Sorry. No, so the reason, the reason why you can assume that it's cow milk... Is because there's FDA requirements that they're not allowed to change um, and put anything else inside of it. There was an interesting case that came up in in Illinois. The CRC actually worked on this case that there was some. Because of that, you can assume that you know based on FDA requirements that all the milk is kosher because it's all from cows. 
I forgot the exact case of the uh, like scenario of the case, but there's something where they wanted to allow there to be another kind of milk. I think it was camel milk, but some other kind of milk that, meaning I think officially the FDA allows you to use any mammal's milk. It doesn't have to be camel milk and call it milk to be titled milk, but it was never practical from a from a monetary perspective for anyone to ever use anything else other than than cow milk. But there was something else that recently came up in the Illinois area. I'll have to look it up and get back to that case. You can Google it. I don't know if I want to. It sounds and, like uh, no, so they, they, the CRC took it went to like the state court or whatever it was to try to legislate it to make sure that you would have to label it as being, can't be labeled as American milk. Because if that would exist, if there was somehow now some concern that legally you'd be able to call something regular milk without it coming from a cow, that would obviously produce kosher problems and you then have to have better certification on each one. But for now, definitely is a case that everything's fine. It actually um, made me think of a question. So, like... I know, like, sometimes at, like, grocery stores, like, Tom Thumb, they have, like, a separate kosher dairy section. No. Um, what would differentiate that from, like, the regular dairy? So, if it's just milk, regular, like we said before, milk is fine. But milk is uniquely fine because generally milk has no additives and it's just milk that's been pasteurized. That's all milk normally is, so there's no kosher concerns with it. Just about every other product, there's flavors and stuff added into it. So, for example, cheeses and um, yogurts and all other dairy products, you would need to have proper kosher certification on because just to ensure that all the flavors going into it are fine. Um, if you have a kosher certification, you go to Tom Tom, there's, you go to the regular yogurt section, they have kosher yogurts there, even though they're not in the kosher dairy section. There's nothing wrong with that. Those has a kosher certification on it. It's fine. The kosher dairy section, a lot of time, is something else called Chol of Yisrael, yeah. which is um, the concept of Chol of Yisrael basically is that officially all milk really has to be supervised with a Jew in the room at the time of the milking. The reason why we're lenient on all milk in general, like Mark was saying before, is because of my Feinstein writes that in countries such as America and other places where there's high penalties, if you would, and it's government regulated and watched, if you were to change what goes inside of it, so that satisfies the same requirements it's just as if a Jew was in that room watching it. Right. So it's considered the same thing. There are, most people rely on that. There are people that don't rely on that and say, no, we want to go stringent and make sure it was actually a Jew in the room watching it be, supervising it. So that's what we refer to nowadays as Chol of Yisrael. Okay. And those, so you'll have in the dairy section of Tom Thumb, a lot of the products there will be the Chol of Yisrael products, which are generally more expensive than the yeah. non-versions. And I wondered about that because I'm like, well, Jesus, cheese. Right, well, because they have to do with, uh, with the Mashpiach. So. There's only yeah. a few plants that make like that and they have to import them from... East Coast and stuff, and yeah. it's not just like the same craft. Uh, so cheese I looked into, there's an in- ingredient called rennet in it that's made from... Oh, really? Animal intestine. From, yeah, the lining of a cow's stomach. Right, that's how you make the cheese. Yeah. It, that's what, one of the enzymes to... Uh, so the kosher ones, they have something else. Okay. Mm-hmm. Huh. Just Good to know. Because yeah, I was going <laughs> to that when we started going kosher. I wouldn't have thought that, though, because cheese comes from right. cows. Yeah, well, cows are meat. Well, there's pork rennet also. Well, there's milk comes from cows. Exactly. And any milk, any thing else. Yes. And happy cows come from where? Just practically speaking, does... Uh, would you say that Rabbi Klein... Rabbi Klein is the one who will come to your house to make your house kosher yeah. when that time comes. So they He's the head of the, of the DK. Is that, do they charge you to come in and do that? Um, I have no idea. Does anyone know? Do they charge to do that? I could find out for you. I definitely could find uh, out for you. I, I don't know offhand don't what they do. Next week. Um. <laughs> <laughs> I think it's just part of the Dallas kosher membership dues. Oh, yeah, I think they'll do it. Oh, yeah. Well, I'm, I don't pay the membership dues. And donations. Yeah. Donations, donate. obviously. <laughs> yeah. But um, I, if it is, I don't think it's anything, yeah. it's anything major. Oh, but um, okay, fine. So, cool. any other questions? Granite countertops. I hear they're fine. So granite countertops are normally made from one solid piece of rock. That's a real granite countertops or one piece of rock. If it's one piece of rock, that's the best thing to have because if it's one piece, it's easy. It, we say the taste kind of like transfers equally and you can kosher it equally and it's like the easiest thing to deal with. There's like fake granite they have when you want to have like, you know, like pleather type things. They have like fake granite, which is actually composed of, no, it's made of rock, but it's made of like cement, like made of like, not doesn't look like cement, it looks like granite, but it's made of a lot of little rocks that are look like the one sheet, but they're not actually one sheet, that's much more problematic because you can't um, kosher the same way because it's like 22,000 different vessels rather than just one vessel. But if it's a real granite countertop, that is one of the easier things to switch over to make kosher. So that'd be, that'd be fine. You just pour boiling water on it, right? 
There's different ways to do it. Generally, you just pour boiling water over it. Yeah, be careful to hit almost every spot and stuff. And but that's yeah, it's a pretty simple process. Some people take an iron, an iron water on it. <laughs> Sounds more exciting now. <laughs> <Sounds dangerous>. <laughs> <laughs> I was learning these laws. I remember my the rabbi was teaching me. His name was Rabbi Lerner. I learned these laws, uh, all the laws of kosher by. So he said, like some people say, you could put a, uh, you know, an iron to. Make it like heat it up on the spot, but like I value you guys' lives more than that, so please don't try that. And <laughs> someone goes like, "I've done that every year for the last fifteen years. Like it's fine. There's nothing happens. I don't know. You know, check it out yourself or not. Whatever you so deserve the desire. Okay, great. This is the part three kitchen. Any other questions that come up, you can always text, email, whatever. Same with the next class. Um, this is really now completed in my mind. Basically, most of the practical kosher kitchen stuff. Um, we did kosher products, milk and meat, and the kosher kitchen. The next class is going to be on um, basically almost everything else kosher, other concepts that whatever we'll talk about them then, but everything else that comes up re- relating to kosher, more, more or less. Um, any other questions that are regarding like the kosher kitchen stuff, think of, test them out, questions that come up by you, pass them forward and... Great, looking forward. Okay, feel free to take a little more food before they leave.